Okay, now we'll have a talk by Francesco Benini, who is not Leo Pandasayas. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Is, it, is it better? Okay. Okay, so, uh, so in these lectures I will talk about supersymmetric localization. And uh, you actually had already the, the first lecture by Leo. Um, that essentially explain the basic idea, although in a much simpler um, realization, the basic idea about, uh, behind localization. So essentially what I, will do, uh, what, what I will do will be to spell out some of the details that you have in the full quantum field theory setup. Uh, but so, so uh, supersymmetric localization is a very powerful technique which allows us to perform exact non-perturbative computations in certain, in certain uh, field theories. And uh, while essentially it is an infinite dimensional version of uh, the equivalent localization that uh, uh, Leo uh, explained. So let me start with a little bit of uh, motivation. So, um, so we're interested in quantum field theories. And well, at least in principle, all the information about a quantum field theory is contained into the uh, Euclidean path integral. So roughly this is an integral where all field configurations in the theory, uh, e to the minus the action, which is some function of the field configurations, divided by h bar, this is the Euclidean one. And uh, uh, so, so uh, this object is an infinite dimensional integral because we integrate over all field configurations on, on some manifold, on some space time. And so even though formally this contains all the information we want, in practice it is too hard to solve in general. And so we know what is the standard uh, approach. So we can do some perturbative expansion of the action. We do perturbative computations. And this works perfectly fine at weak coupling. But it doesn't work at strong coupling, where the coefficients that we use to expand are order one, right? Because all terms in the, in, the, in the expansion are equally important, so we should compute all perturbative computations. And even though if we do that, uh, if you are able to do th this and sum them, still in general the series is only asymptotic. We will need to compute non-perturbative corrections, uh, and so the problem is, 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 is hard. So what do we do? Well, of course, uh, this is a uh, problem with a long history, so many different approaches have been developed. And one possible approach is to study some class of field theories for which maybe some path integral can actually be done. Okay? This would be some restricted class of theories. Uh, and in fact, for, uh, um, for a long time, so lo localization has been known for, uh, for, uh, for a long time, probably 30 years or something like that. But for a long time, it, it was thought that this class of theories in which we can actually exactly perform uh, computation of the path integral was some restricted class of theories, maybe some cohomological theories, some topological theories, but very specific theories. Uh, but somehow uh, the, 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 the realization that had sparkled, the sort of mini revolution in this context, was to understand, and this follows from work of Nekrasov and Pestum, uh, to understand, in fact, the class of theories in which we can do exactly some of these path integrals is, is much larger and includes a standard quantum field theories or um, almost standard quantum field theories that we might be interested in. And in particular, this includes uh, very physical um, supersymmetric gauge theories. Uh, so before going on, let, let me stress that in these theories that we will discuss, even though we are able to do some path integrals, we will not be able to do all possible path integrals. So that will mean that we can actually solve the theory because we can compute all possible observables. <coughs> this would be uh, awesome, but this is a dream. This is not uh, how, how, how it is right now. So we will be able to compute some path integrals. In particular, we will be able to include some sources 
in the action, and this will give us access to some obser observables. Um, but, but in fact, this would be a pretty interesting and large class of observables that we will be able to compute, and so this will give us uh, quite some interesting information about, about those theories, even though we cannot yet solve completely the theories. So, so the objective of this lecture is to see how to compute objects like the following. Um, so let me write this um, with a little bit more detail. So we want to compute some Euclidean partition functions. So, uh, so this will be, once again, part integrals of the theory. So we look at the Euclidean theory. And we will place the Euclidean theory on some compact manifold M. So this will be some compact manifold. And here we want to compute, so once again, these are weighted by uh, the classical action. We set h bar to 1. And in general, there will be some parameters that we call t for now. Uh, so these parameters might control even so, e either some, some sources that we turn on in the action, or there might be some coupling constants, and we want the dependence on the coupling constants. Or they might control the compact manifold where we put these theories. They might control some background that we turn on. Um, now, uh, well, we will choose the Euclidean theory and compact manifold because this will solve uh, various type of divergences, in particular infrared divergences. Uh, and so in particular, this object will be truly uh, functions of these of this, of this, uh, parameters t. Uh, or if you want, the patent will give us numbers, OK? Because we consider some compact manifolds. Now, in fact, it is a very profitable exercise to try to study. So if, if I give you some quantum field theory, it is a very good exercise to try to put this theory on very different uh, and many different compact manifolds, possibly with different type of backgrounds, uh, background gauge fields or other type of background fields. Um, because this, uh, well, because of a couple of reasons. So, uh, so first of all, um, when we do this exercise on different types of, of manifolds and on backgrounds, and uh, we apply uh, the technique that we are going to describe, so localization, um, well, on some manifold and some background, this, this path integral reduces to something that can be much, uh, can be more or less simple. So in some situations, this will be reduced to a simpler problem and still to a problem which is relatively hard. But in some cases, this is reduced to a very simple problem. And then we can actually carry out this computation in a very explicit way. So this is a good reason uh, to explore uh, different manifolds to see um, in which cases we can get very explicit answers. Um, so if you wish, uh, different M implies different levels of complexity. Uh, and, uh, well, more, more importantly, um, essentially studying the quantum field theory on different manifolds uh, grants us access to different sectors of uh, observables uh, and data about the theory. And so even though on a, on a simple manifold we might get some information that we say, okay, uh, this is very uh, restricted information, but in fact as we change M, we can get access to a relatively large set of data uh, about the quantum field theory. We can learn a lot about the quantum field theory. Um, so uh, essentially, the second point is that we get different uh, class of observables. Uh, and in particular, these classes of observables can contain either uh, holomorphic correlators. This, this observable has been known for a long time since the early days of localization, uh, but also some uh, holomorphic, non-holomorphic correlators or conserved currents and so on. So things that uh, in the past were not uh, known to be um, um, extractable from, from uh, um, localization. Okay. So this will be our general program. Do we have questions so far? Okay. So, uh, so since we want to study these quantum, uh, well, uh, quantum field theories on compact uh, and in particular curved manifolds, so of course we could receive to flat manifolds, but it would be a, a small set. 
Um, and we want to apply the, the technique of supersymmetric localization, which in particular, as the word suggests, requires supersymmetry. Uh, we need to understand how to preserve supersymmetry on curved manifolds, so on all these manifolds. And we also want to understand what type of supersymmetric backgrounds we can turn on. And so the first thing that I would like to address, although in a kind of brief way, is uh, how do we preserve supersymmetry on a curved manifold? Uh, given supersymmetry on a, on a, on a, on a on flat space. Um, and, and this turns out to be a non-trivial problem. OK. Um, so, uh, so in particular, this, this, uh, this, this, questions, uh, this question overlaps uh, quite a bit with uh, Stefan uh, lectures. Lecture. So, uh, so let's start from the basics. So we start uh, Lorentzian flat space. Uh, then we know that the supersymmetry algebra is an algebra that enlarges the Poincaré algebra of symmetries with some fermionic generators. And for instance, we know very well, if we consider four dimensional minimal n equal one supersymmetry, uh, what we add are the generators Q and the anti commutator of the, of the supercharges uh, schematically gives uh, translations. Okay, they give us uh, momentum, while the other ones, Q with Q and Q bar with Q bar, uh, anti commute. Now, if we go in a local quantum field theory, uh, the supercharges can be written as an integral of currents, uh, which are called the supersymmetry currents. And this is true in any dimension for any amount of supersymmetry. So I'm not restricting now just to only to this case. Um, so the supersymmetry current uh, contains a vector index and a spinor index. And as any other current, uh, they, they have the property if we integrate it on a co-dimension one uh, subspace, uh, we generate the charges. So in particular, we take a, a slice of the space at constant time, uh, and we construct the charges. Uh, the, uh, the x, so we take the zero component. This gives us the supercharges. And uh, uh, well, a theory is supersymmetric, uh, if you wish, if these uh, supersymmetry currents are conserved. Can you press on the short end if you like slightly larger? Uh, larger? And press on the short Okay. OK. Well, it's not going to change much. But I, I, it's easy for me to write larger, but what you ask, I'm not so sure. <laughs> OK, so if this supersymmetry current is, is conserved, it means that um, the theory is supersymmetric. Now, if you look at theories with a Lagrangian description, and this is, this is the setup that we will restrict to, because we want to compute path integrals, and so in particular we need the Lagrangian, or at least an action, um, then um, well, what happens is the, 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 the action is invariant under the, the, the action of the super, uh, supercharges, and so the Lagrangian is invariant and up to total derivatives. Sorry. Um, yep. And so uh, the variation of the. So the variation of the Lagrangian uh, will be a total derivative of something. And this, this delta is uh, uh, an anti-commuting scalar operator, which comes from uh, contracting the supercharges with some uh, um, commuting and spinorial uh, parameters, which are the supersymmetry parameters. So like in Stefan's lecture, but uh, for now, these are constant. So now we start with a theory, an Euclidean theory in flat space, uh, which is supersymmetric. And we want to place this theory on a, on a curved manifold, on a smooth curve manifold. And uh, um, in particular, we require when we do that, that the theory at short distances is not modified. Okay? 
Uh, because of course, when we put the theory on a curve manifold, the we have to change a little bit the theory. So we need to uh, say what do we mean by putting the same theory on a curve manifold. And our definition is that at short distance, the theory is not modified. If you want, because if you take a smooth manifold and you go at very short distances, the manifold is flat, okay? So we want to recover our original theory. And so in particular, we only allow the formations of the Lagrangian which are relevant, okay? Um, and okay, we also restrict to local, uh, local deformations. Uh, now, it turns out that this procedure is ambiguous. So given a theory in flat space, there is no unique way to say what is the theory on a flat space. Uh, essentially, because we can, uh, so if we give some uh, way of putting the theory on a curve manifold, we can always add some other couplings in which we use uh, the curvature uh, invariance of the manifold or some scale of the manifold. And of course, all these couplings disappear if you go on flat, on flat space. Uh, and so there is no unique answer in general. There are different ways to put it on, the, on a manifold. Uh, just counting the dimension of operators. In the UV. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So okay. So first of all, everything that I will say, well, it's classical. Of course, we will compute path integrals, and, and then of course that will be quantum. But these arguments on the on the on the on, on the action are classical. And moreover, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing some RG flow. So I'm literally saying, okay, we start with some theory in flat space. We have dimension of the various couplings, which is a classical dimension. And it's precisely the scale that you mentioned about is precisely what tells us that only the relevant ones are, uh, are uh, allowed to us. Because at short distances, we want uh, this deformation to, to, to disappear. Yes. Okay, um, now uh, we also, now, um, so we also require that the theory preserves some supersymmetries. This is precisely what we want to achieve. And so in particular, uh, so suppose that we preserve some uh, supercharges after putting the theory on some core manifold, then uh, this uh, uh, super algebra that we obtain on a core manifold if you go in the UV, it must be a subalgebra or the flat, flat space supersymmetry algebra. And so in particular, the supercharges that we will be able to preserve are always some subset of the supercharges that we are in flat space. However, the algebra that they preserve might be a deformation of the flat space supersymmetry algebra, and precisely a deformation that comes from uh, the various scales that we introduce when we put the theory on a manifold, uh, but this deformation must once again, disappear when we go in the, in, the, in the UV. So it will be also relevant deformation of the supersymmetry algebra. Um, yet, uh, as we will see, uh, ambiguities survive. So even imposing supersymmetry is not going to fix these ambiguities. Still, uh, there will be different ways of preserving supersymmetry on a curved manifold. And on the other hand, it will not always be possible uh, to preserve supersymmetry on a core manifold. So, uh, so first thing, uh, this problem of putting theories on a core manifold is, is really non-trivial. On some manifolds, there is no way. So this is not always possible. And so one has to answer to the question, what are the manifolds on which we can preserve supersymmetry? Uh, when it is possible, uh, then still there will be ambiguities. OK, so, so how do we do that? Uh, well, as a first attempt, uh, well, we put the theory on a curve manifold. So essentially, ju la la let's just uh, substitute the, 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 mm, the, the, the Minkowski and invariant tensor with, uh, with the metric and standard derivatives with the covariant derivatives. 
So uh, at a mu nu, we substitute with the metric. So from this is a first attempt. And then uh, covariant derivatives, uh, so the standard derivatives go to covariant derivatives. And we do this both in uh, the Lagrangian and uh, in the operator, which is uh, this, um, of the supersymmetry variations. So this sounds reasonable. However, it doesn't work. Because uh, in general, if you compute this variation, uh, that contains the metric and the covariant derivatives of the action of the Lagrangian that contains the metric and the covariant derivatives. Uh, this does give us a, a total covariant derivative of, of something, uh, but plus other terms, okay? And they do not integrate to zero. So supersymmetry is, uh, is spoiled. Uh, unless um, we can find on the manifold a covariantly constant spinor, so some epsilon, so that epsilon um, which satisfies so some function uh, that satisfies this condition. Uh, if this is the case, then there are no other terms, and we do preserve supersymmetry. However, it turns out that this is a very strong condition. Uh, on the manifold, in particular, in two and three dimensions, this implies that the manifold is flat. And in four dimensions, it doesn't have to be flat, but still it has to be richly flat which uh, if the manifold is compact with a very strong condition. So this is too strong. I mean, it's OK, but it's too strong. We would like to do better. So, um, so there are two strategies that we can try to follow. So if you want, uh, here we can write too strong for uh, our taste. OK, so there are two strategies that we can try to follow. So the first strategy is a trial and error procedure. And so, um, so we first of all introduce some scale um, by rescaling uh, the manifold and the metric. So we write our metric. Uh, we replace this to a rescaled version of it. And then uh, we try to expand both uh, the Lagrangian and this uh, supersymmetry operator in, in powers of, of this R. And we organize the terms order by order in R. And we try to make things work. So we take delta. So the first term is, of course, uh, the delta in which we put the metric and the covariant derivative. But you say this is not enough. And so we write down corrections. Um, which are awaited by these powers of R. And we do the same thing with the, with the Lagrangian. OK. Uh, so we construct these terms order by order in such a way that uh, each order cancels the problem that we had at the at previous order. Um, and, uh, um, and the important thing here is that since we restrict to relevant deformations, in particular if you look here, there is only a finite number of terms that we can write down. So the, I wrote it as a series, but in fact this is a finite number of terms. Okay. Because at some point, then these corrections are irrelevant, but we exclude those. We want, want to restrict to relevant deformations. So there's only a no finite number of terms that we can write here. Uh, however, it doesn't mean that we are going to succeed. Uh, so when we have exhaust the possible terms here, either we got an answer that works or, 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 or uh, we didn't. Okay? So this is not guaranteed to work, but at least it's some finite procedure we can really do okay, in a finite amount of time. So in fact, this procedure is correct. Um, and has been used uh, a lot in the literature of, loca of localization uh, because they, well, I don't know, it's the most straightforward thing to do. Um, but uh, it has a, a, a few drawbacks. So first of all, as I said, it's not guaranteed to work, and we will, under we will understand why. Um, 
but okay, essentially because not all manifolds admit supersymmetry, so in those cases you just uh, finish your terms and it just, you just cannot cancel the variations. Well, it's also a bit tedious because you have to do this order by order, um, and especially if you don't have much symmetry on the manifold, it might be complicated. Um, but more importantly, the underlying structure is, is not clear, right? If you fail, it's not clear why you failed. Um, the, 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 yeah, the, you, you don't understand on which manifolds you are going to succeed, on which manifolds you are, you are not. So, so, so the second method instead, yeah. Yes, of course, it's up to you to be able to write down all possible yeah. terms. Yeah. And as I said, I mean, technically, it might be quite difficult, maybe impossible, because maybe if not, as I mean, it's too complicated. But if you have enough symmetry, this is easier to do. In fact, it's easier than maybe than the general method where you have to, well, once you have the answer, of course, the general method is, is easier. But um, yeah, OK, this is just one, one method. What is the effect of what, sorry? Uh, well, because, you know, the supercharges, the Q, uh, in a given theory, I realized then some function. Yes, well, uh, you know, this, this, so this delta is epsilon Q. And Q is an integral of S. And Q is, uh, well, yes, is an integral of S. So it's 2L. Yeah, I mean, it's not, well, okay. But when you start, uh, you have some L. So in flat space, you have some L. And the supercharge has some expression in the fields. I don't know, the variation of the scalar is a derivative of the fermion. The variation of the, sorry, is the fermion. Yes, you modify L. And then if you want uh, that uh, this work, um, and it's just, I mean, you can try to just modify L. But this is not going to work for sure. You, you see that you also have to correct this, how the supercharges act okay. if you want some hope. But there's no L independent. Not, not no, no, no. They are correlated, right? Because this acts on L, and you want that things cancel out. Yeah. So is capital R is dimensionless or dimension? No, no, it's dimension four. Uh, sorry, it's the. OK, so we can say that this G, this is a dimensionless metric, if you wish, and then you put the dimension in R. Or, 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 or you can keep dimension here, and then this R is dimensionless. But of course, it, it uh, encodes the fact that it encodes R scaling. OK, so the second, well, uh, any other question? Yeah. Sorry, so this is over here, can you repeat the first metric? No, it's the one where you substitute the curve metric and the covariant derivative. Ah, okay. So it doesn't have an explicit, depends on R, besides the curve metric and covariant derivative. Yeah. But as we said, this is not enough, so you need extra things. Just to introduce an expansion parameter. Because we have this. Sorry? It's not going to change. I mean, here I'm, I have a totally. So this is a curve metric. This G0 is an uh, arbitrary curve metric. I just want to organize my terms. And keep into account this constraint that I put, which is, some, is a physical constraint, it's not a mathematical one, that I'm restricting to relevant deformations. I could remove that constraint, but then in some sense, I'm not discussing the very same theory from plus space to a curve manifold. Then it's a, another random theory, which is modified in the UV as well. Um, so this is just to implement that. Yes. Yes, so if you require on the manifold that there exists uh, a spinor, so this is a, um, a, a function, is, is commuting, but it's spinorial. So if you impose this, so first of all, this epsilon is never vanishing, just because it's covariantly constant. So you have this van uh, never vanishing um, spinorial function on it, and these are strong conditions. So for instance, you can multiply by another covariant derivative and take a commutator. And from this, you can derive that r mu nu on the manifold is equal to 0. So the manifold has to be Ricci flat. 
It's a very simple exercise. You multiply by R uh, delta nu, you play with it. I mean, I can give you the details afterwards if you want. So you get this condition. Now, this is very strong because if you are in two and three dimensions, this tells you that the Riemann is zero. So the metric is flat. So in two and three D, this tells you the Riemann uh, mu nu rho sigma is zero. So the manifold is flat, so it's just a torus. Um, and in four dimensions, again, it's not just flat because this is Ricci flat, but essentially give you only T4 and the K3 as possible manifolds. So, so it's very restrictive. We can do, I'm saying that we can do, I mean, we can't stop here and say these are the manifolds where we can preserve supersymmetry. Yeah. But we can do better than that by adding these extra terms. So you'll we'll, we'll find some manifolds that are not rich flat yeah. and that preserves supersymmetry. Yeah. Uh, well, in five dimensions, there are not Calabiao manifolds, uh, but still this is a certain uh, strong condition. Yeah, I don't know if this is, uh, well, I should think about in five. Uh, okay. uh, this is the way, uh, for example, we always uh, reduce uh, string theory or n-theory to, uh, for example, four dimensions by uh, compacting this. Uh, well, but we can do better in string theory as well, right? We can turn on fluxes or other more complicated backgrounds. So even in that context, we can, uh, we can do better. Of course, OK, if you are in six dimensions, you have all the Calabiaus. They are just trivial. You're uh, uh, searching for more. Yes. Uh, yes, OK. I mean, these are, well, in two and three dimensions are trivial. I agree, in six dimensions, these are Calabiaus. They're not trivial. But still, uh, my only message is we can do better. OK, so, so the other thing is to use some uh, systematic method. And this is due to uh, Festuccio and Seiberg initially. Well, at least they explored this, man, this, this method in, in, in full generality. I mean, this method is not giving you less than this. I mean, this is correct. It's just that it's tedious, complicated. Maybe you're not technically able to find all solutions because you need to write this math. But uh, I mean, this, in principle, can give you all solutions. This is just, uh, you know, every time that you have some problem, if you can find a systematic method to do that, it's more elegant, it's better, right? Okay, so let's uh, describe this method. And essentially, this method, in, in, in a word, what it consists to, um, what it consists in, is uh, in coupling the theory to uh, supergravity, to offshell supergravity. Uh, and then take a. Um, take a, a rigid limit in which you send the, the, the Planck constant to, um, well, the Newton constant to 0 of the Planck mass to infinity. And so in this sense, we make connection with Stefan's uh, well, lecture today and uh, probably in the following days as well. Yes. So this method, I mentioned this because this came first. It's a very most straightforward thing that you can think about. And uh, uh, so S4 partition function, S3 partition function, S2 partition function were done with this. And then Festuch and Cyber came with their method, and this allowed to construct many more uh, interesting and complicated solutions. But people did a lot with this before. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm talking about uh, the past and computation. I mean, past and this computation without first and cyber. Uh, also, the, well, yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, this, uh, I mean, they were not the first. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 sorry, yes, 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 yes. Absolutely, yes. Okay, um, so, so let's describe this method. So what do we do? Um, so, okay, we want to put the theory on a curve manifold, so let's proceed in the following way. Uh, so, okay, let's first think without supersymmetry. So what we do, we take the theory, we couple to metric in a ger generally covariant way. Um, so in particular, we include some new field, g mu nu, okay, this is our metric, this is our field. Uh, we couple to, to the theory in a generally covariant way. And then we give an expectation value to this field. The expectation value is the metric on the manifold that we want to study. Now, of course, now we have one more field, so we have more equations of motion. In particular, when we do the variation with respect to the metric, we have Einstein equations. Uh, and these Einstein equations put constraint on the metric, so would limit uh, the, the type of manifolds where we can put the theory on. However, um, what we can do is we, we can take this, this rigid limit in, we, in which we send the Newton constant to, uh, to zero or the Planck mass to infinity. And in this case, we don't impose, so this freezes, if you want this, this degrees of freedom, so we don't impose Einstein equation anymore, and we can consider any possible expectation values for these fields. Okay? This allows us to consider any possible metric. Okay? This is, I'm saying something trivial here, if you wish. However, uh, now let's consider supersymmetry. So uh, if we have supersymmetry, uh, now we don't just couple to gravity, but we couple to supergravity. And, uh, um, and uh, um, And it turns out that in order to, and we will see this uh, in a moment, in order to make this method work, in fact, we should couple to offshell supergravity. And in particular, as we saw in uh, Stefan's lecture, in offshell supergravity there are extra fields, extra auxiliary fields. Um, uh, such that the supersymmetry algebra closes uh, of shell, we don't need the equations of motion. Um, so how do we couple the theory to um, offshore supergravity? Well, uh, first of all, um, so okay, we are, we, are, we are discussing local theories. So first of all, we have a stress tensor. Uh, symmetric and conserved stress tensor. And the stress tensor, together with the supersymmetry current that we also have and we discussed at the beginning, uh, they sit in the same uh, multiplet, in the same supersymmetry multiplet which is called a supercurrent multiplet. <coughs> and uh, well, it turns out that this is in supercurrent multiplet. There are not just these two operators, but in fact there are um, other operators of spin less or equal to 1. Okay? So here there are other operators. In particular, this is spin 2, spin 3 halves, but then there are other operators of spin 1, spin 1 half, spin 0. Um, and uh, uh, but in fact, it turns out that there are different types of supercurrent multiplets that one can construct. So one multiplet that one can always construct is called the S multiplet. Uh, 
And this multiplet always exists. So you give me some supersymmetric theory in any dimension with any amount of supersymmetry, this S multiplet exists. However, this multiplet in general is, is, is pretty long. Uh, for instance, uh, if we are in four dimensional minimal supersymmetry, it, it contains 16 bosonic and 16 fermionic independent components. So it's, uh, it's pretty long. It's, it's larger than what uh, Stefan's uh, described. However, if the theory has some uh, um, special, uh, special properties, then it might be possible to find a smaller multiplet that still contains these two guys, but that it contains less other operators. Okay? Um, so another way to phrase it that one can do some uh, improvement transformation to set to zero some of the, of the operators in this multiplet. And so what are other interesting cases? Well, if the theory contains uh, a conserved R symmetry, and as Stefan uh, stressed, a supersymmetric theory does not need to have an R symmetry, okay? This is an outer automorphism of the algebra, it's not part of the algebra, so it need not be there, but if it is there, one can reduce to a smaller multiplet, which is called the R multiplet. And uh, in particular, this R multiplet contains this conserved, uh, uh, conserved current. And then there is another multiplet that, roughly speaking, one can obtain if uh, some target space for scalars um, does not have two cycles, and there is no affiliate Oplos term, uh, but okay, this will not be particularly important. Let me just mention it. This is the Ferrara Zumino multiplet. Uh, and then if the theory is actually super conformal, it's not just super symmetric, uh, in fact, one can find, well, it's just a super conformal multiple that contains these two, these two guys. So these multiplets are, are simpler than the S multiplet. Another connection with Stefan's uh, lecture comes because, in fact, to each offshore formulation of supergravity correspond one of these supercurrent multiplets. So if you want to off offshore uh, supergravity, this corresponds to some uh, so a uh, supercurrent multiplet. And uh, if you want, why is that? Well, because this uh, uh, supergravity has to couple to the quantum field theory at the linearized level. It couples to operators in the field theory. And so there is a pairing of fields uh, in the supergravity multiplet with uh, uh, operators in the supercurrent multiplet. So the basic example that we, of course, we are very familiar with is, uh, uh, so in the graviton In a graviton multiplet, of course, there is the metric. Uh, this is the first field that is there. And of course, we know at the linearized level how the graviton couples to the field theory, couples to, through the stress tensor. Um, so here we have the supercurrent multiplet. Uh, and in fact, at the linearized level, once again, so if we take the Lagrangian at the linearized level of supergravity, uh, the, 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 the coupling is the obvious one, right? The metric couples to the stress tensor. Uh, but then we are in supergravity, so there is also the gravitino here. And how does it couple to the theory at the linearized level through the supersymmetry current? And in fact, here in the Lagrangian, there will be another term um, where they are coupled linearly. And then, as we said, so here in general in this multiplet there are other operators of spin less or equal to one. In the same way in the graviton multiplet there are other auxiliary fields of spin less or equal to one that Stefan described, and they are coupled. So, uh, well, for instance, we can, have, uh, we can have some vector, or we could have a spinner, or we could have a scalar, 
and which one uh, really depends on the particular offshore supergravity that we are considering. And in the same way, here we can have some current, which is uh, um, either conserved or not, depending on whether this is massless or not. Um, we can have some spinorial operator. Uh, we can have some scalar operator and so on. And they are coupled in the obvious way. So currents are coupled to gauge fields, um, spinors to spinors, scalars to scalars, in the obvious way. And so, so this simple fact gives us a, a, um, a correspondence between off-shell formulations and uh, um, uh, supercurrent multiplets in the, in the field theory. Any, any questions? No, no, this is pretty, pretty general. Uh, yes. But you might not have off shell formulations. Yes. In fact, notice that this is not a double arrow. Uh, of course, you might expect the opposite, that for every supercurrent multiple, there should be an off shell formulation. So I just learned that in four dimensions for the, S, for the full S multiple, in fact, there is. I, I, I didn't know that. But there is an off shell formulation. Um, you know, if, if, you have, if the supersymmetry is, is, is large enough, there might be a problem with this. Uh, and in fact, the statement I'm making here is, is in, in this direction. Okay, so, so now that we have this, uh, what do we do? Well, we do the same thing that we do that was pretty trivial before. So now we take the bosonic fields in this uh, supergravity action, and so this supergravity theory, which is coupled to our field theory, and we give an expectation value to the bosonic fields, uh, in particular to the metric, but also to the other bosonic fields, for instance, to, to, to vector fields or to scalar fields. And then we take a rigid limit in which we send Newton constant to zero in such a way that we uh, get rid of the extra equations of motion that we get from varying the supergravity fields. Um, and, uh, and then these bosonic fields are not, are not constrained. Uh, and in this limit, we keep fixed the background. So we don't impose uh, the equations of motion. Uh, but we still want supersymmetry. And so we do impose uh, the, 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 the supersymmetry variations are 0. And so in particular, we impose the, vari the, the vanishing of the uh, Gravitino variation. Now, this uh, variation in general takes the following form. I'm not sure, I mean, probably this too depends on the conventions, so this is not particularly important. Uh, but, okay, so this is the covariant derivative of the, of the parameter epsilon. Uh, and then, in general, there is some matrix um, that depends, which is constructed of the supergravity fields. And this, uh, okay, this function or this matrix will have uh, vector and spinor indices, uh, and acts linearly uh, on epsilon uh, and gives us this. Okay, so since I'm discussing general case here, I'm not specifying what we have here. Uh, so let's call this a generalized uh, killing spinor equation. But the important point here is that uh, because we are working with optional uh, uh, supersymmetry, what appear in these gravitino variations are only the supergravity fields. If we were doing this with the onshell formulation, here in general we have complicated function of all the other fields in the theory, and in particular what we have, the particular function of the fields will depend on the Lagrangian and will be very much theory dependent. However, if we do it for, with offshell supergravity, uh, super uh, 
only the supergravity fields appear here. You see the, 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 the matter fields of our supersymmetric theory do not appear anywhere. Uh, and so in particular, the form of this equation is completely independent of what theory we, we are trying to put on a curve manifold, okay? And so this is the crucial point um, because uh, we can discuss the problem of supersymmetry on a curve manifold in a way which is almost independent of the particular theory that we are discussing, okay? We just have to solve this equation, but this is independent of the theory. It's not completely independent because um, because, um, well, if we want to couple to a certain supercurrent mass, so if we want to use some offshore formulation of gravity, we need that the theory contains a certain supercurrent multiplet, and which type of supercurrent multiplet the theory has does depend on the theory. So there is a certain dependence, a mild dependence on the theory, but after that dependence, um, after this, this fact has been taken into account, there is no further dependence on the theory. Okay, and we can stop discussing the theory and just look at this equation. Is this point clear? Because this is a cr crucial point. So you say that if you have the offshore supergravity interactivity, makes it contraction, but it will be not dependent? So the, the dependence on, sorry, your, your, your question was about what? If it's, if it's offshore supergravity, yeah, onshore. then you say that it will be not dependent? Yeah, then it's, uh, yeah, then it's very, com I mean, you can still do it, but it's very complicated because then this equation strongly depends on your theory, what is the action of your supersymmetric theory, and so on. Um, and probably this is, uh, uh, this is the reason why, I mean, this was maybe the, okay, one of the crucial observations of Festus and Cyber, that if you do it in offshore supergravity, the problem decouples from discussing a particular theory, and we can just discuss this equation. Yes. Yes. Yes, this is very general. I mean, when you couple the, I mean, the way in which the graviton multiplet couples to all the other fields, yeah. which I will call my supersymmetric theory, yeah. so, you know, vector multiplets, hypermultiplets, chiral multiplets, and so on. At the linearized level, it couples this way. And of course, there are higher order terms, okay. but the linearized level is how it couples. No? So you could also just take what Stefan did and, and write that? Yeah. Uh, yes. It's exactly the same thing? Uh, yes. Yes. It's, well, it's compatible with, with what he said. And this ambiguity, what is the first step there is some ambiguity in what action is it? Uh, so the ambiguity is that, uh, so at the level of gravity, so as Stefan said, so you can take an on-shell supergravity, so you take some supergravity, and there are different off-shell formulations of so it. In one off-shell formulation? Yes. Stefan did talk about matter multiplets, yes, but you could have not. There'd be some way of coupling that to that supergravity. Yes. So this ambiguity translates to some ambiguity in what way of? Yeah, but precisely the ambiguity. Uh, well, he, he talked about you can either use a chiral multiplet as a compensator or a tensor multiplet as a compensator. Yeah. So those give rise to different off-shell supergravities. Is Are these the ambiguities you're talking about? I, I, I'm asking you, is that precisely the ambiguities you're talking about? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yes, because the one that he described with the chiral multiplet gives you the Ferrara Zumino, the old minimal supergravity that couples to the Ferrara Zumino multiplet. And then uh, uh, he mentioned the other one where you couple to the tensor compensator that give you the uh, new minimal supergravity that couples to the R multiplet. And uh, well, I asked him uh, after <laughs> one hour ago, and he told me that even the S multiplet, there is some uh, off-shell supergravity where you have some other um, compensator that I, I don't know what it is, but. Yeah, I'm not going through the, somehow I'm jumping to the end result after the compensator as uh, you have gauge away the compensator and you are left with some uh, offshore formulation of supergravity, which is not super conformal right. gravity. What the math is like, can I understand like, what Stefan was describing, like, I mean, that for the compensator, mm. it's like, it's a relevant deformation of 
Uh, I'm not sure. I, I've never seen it. Uh, it might be possible, but I don't know. Okay. Um, so okay. Um, so 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 we have to solve this uh, this equation, this generalized kinetic spinor equation, and when we solve it, we have to solve it both for these supergravity fields. such as, of course, the metric, but possibly also some vector fields, some scalars. Let me write here. So this, this, these extra fields. And in fact, these extra fields are, are what I would call the background. So when I say that we put the theorem on a manifold with a certain background, I mean that there is not just the metric of the manifold, but there is also these other fields, which are classical, but still we have to specify them. They control couplings in the, in the final um, Lagrangian. Um, but we also have to solve for epsilon, of course, in this equation. Uh, and depend for each solution at fixed values of these uh, fields, uh, for each solution in epsilon, we have one more uh, supercharge. So depending on how many solutions we can preserve here, uh, then we have uh, uh, as many preserved supercharges on the curved manifold. Okay? And this, this number can, 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 can vary. Uh, in particular, if you don't find any solution, it means that we cannot preserve uh, supersymmetry. Um, okay, so in particular, let me stress, uh, this maybe we, we have already said, but let me stress it one more, that given a given theory, we can couple this theory to different, so as long as we have supercurrent multiplets, so a given theory might admit different supercurrent multiplets, so as long as this is the case, we can couple the very same theory to different offshore formulations of supergravity. So, um, and for each different offshore formulation of supergravity, we, can, we have a different equation that depends on different type of background fields. And so this will give us a different way to preserve supersymmetry on a curved manifold. Okay, even though it's the very same theory, but this so we should explore the various cases to see uh, the various types of ways that we have to preserve supersymmetry on a curved manifold. Uh, okay, so for instance, there are four dimensional theories that admit both Ferrar's domino multiplet and R multiplet, and that gives us rise to different ways of preserving supersymmetry on, on, on different classes of curved manifolds. So, so uh, once we have done this, uh, essentially we are done. So we have solved the problem. Because, uh, first of all, we have found uh, our backgrounds that can preserve supersymmetry on, uh, um, so we have found, uh, if you want, the class of ma manifolds and uh, backgrounds uh, that admit uh, uh, supersymmetry. But also, then we can take these backgrounds and we ca can plug them back both in the uh, algebra of variations of the, of the supergravity. Of course, the supergravity comes with how the, 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 what, what are the variations of the various fields under, under supersymmetry transformations. So uh, we also get the deformed supersymmetry algebra. Uh, and we also uh, read off what is the action, because we just plug in the values of these background fields in the full supergravity action, and we are left with the uh, deformed action for the, for the matter fields. So the formed um, uh, quantum field theory action. OK, so essentially this, uh, if we draw, find a solution to this, this solve our, uh, our problem. And I guess I have to stop here. OK.